The federal government could soon hit its limit on borrowing and no longer be able to pay its bills. That's causing a mad dash for compromise in Washington. Coming up, a discussion on the debt ceiling deadline. Stay with us at Issue starts now. Lawmakers have multiple plans on the table to reopen the government and forestall an economy rattling default on U.S. obligations. Talk is the debt ceiling would be raised enough for the government to pay its bills through February the 7th. The United States is the largest debtor on the planet, owing roughly $12 trillion to public investors. But what does all this current debt obligation mean to us? We're joined by Eastern Illinois University Professor Dr. Tashome Abebe. Thank you so much for joining us. You, you turn on the TV and all you hear is the debt ceiling, the debt ceiling, the debt ceiling. And I think we need to start there. What is the debt ceiling? The debt ceiling is not actually a ceiling per se because from time to time we continue to blow up a hole in it and it's not a permanent ceiling per se, but it is an agreement between um, Congress and of course the President of the United States of how much money would be available to borrow, in other words how much uh, the government is able to borrow uh, in the private uh, market as well as from individuals. So the ceiling is really a limit as to, for example, for next year, how much money the government can uh, uh, or is allowed to borrow. That is set by Congress in agreement with the uh, President of the United States. As you know, the government of the United States takes in about $2.5 trillion in revenue each year, but its obligations are about $4 trillion. So you've got a revenue of $2.5 trillion, approximately, because these numbers continue to change, revenue of about $2.5 trillion, and expenditures commitments of about $4 trillion each year. So there is a big gap in there. This mm -hmm. big gap has got to be covered uh, by loans that the government, um, uh, uh, debt that the government has to incur uh, to pay that balance. And every time we borrow, uh, it pushes this debt ceiling, as it were. Uh, not only in terms of the money, the, 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 the original uh, balance, but also the additional balances and the interest uh, on those balances. That's essentially what the debt ceiling is. Now there's a deadline this week, and, and I must tell our viewers that we're having this conversation on Tuesday. The deadline is Thursday. Um, what is the deadline? What has to be reached by this week? The deadline is a deadline that Congress has set the last time they passed a ceiling, uh, a debt ceiling, and they allowed the president, the government that is, to borrow about uh, an additional $1.5 trillion the last time they did this conversation, they had uh, this uh, issue. Um, and uh, in that negotiation, they set a time period, and. Um, that time period now expires and the government has got to borrow additional funds to pay its obligations. So that's how the deadline came up. I see. What is the main disagreement between lawmakers? Uh, again, as we mentioned at the beginning of this, you turn on the TV and all you hear about is the debt ceiling. The next thing you hear about in the same breath is closed door meetings. The, these lawmakers are meeting and, and the president's meeting with, with heads of this cabinet and this committee. What, um, what is the main sticking point? Essentially, there are political agendas as well as economic, very little economic agenda, but political, uh, mostly political agenda. On one side, mm, lawmakers are saying, for us to be able to raise the debt ceiling, to allow the government to borrow more money, we have first got to address what led us to borrow in the first place. And they've got two major issues, at least initially this is how they started. One of the issues is to broaden the tax base, reform the tax code and broaden the tax base. That was one of the agendas. The second agenda that was publicly stated 
was to reform entitlements, to reduce reform and get a hold of entitlements. As you correctly know, the entitlements that we have have been creeping in into the system, the economic system and the payment system for many decades. And it isn't something that these two issues could be resolved in one day in October 2013. These cannot be done in one day. So these are long-term issues that certainly need to be dealt with. On the other hand, the, the, uh, the president is saying, well, I will negotiate on those kinds of issues provided that uh, you allow me to borrow first because borrowing is one thing that you have allowed in the past. It's happened since 1917. Uh, since then, we have uh, borrowed and uh, raised the debt ceiling over 75 times, most recently last year. And he's saying that's not for negotiation. Let's go ahead and do it just as you have done in the past. All these other issues we will talk about after we have had a chance to raise the debt issue because we have this deadline that you talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Those are the sticking points. So on one end, Republicans, for example, would like to to deal with issues of entitlements, including Obamacare, as, as it is called now. Uh, along with that, they want to change the tax code, maybe reform the tax code. Uh, code. Uh, those are the issues at hand. But these are long-term issues. The problem that we face right now is the issue of default. And the issue of default is not being able to pay your obligations when they are due. And this has serious consequences, and uh, most economists agree that it shouldn't be tied to these other reform issues that would take a long time to deal with. So I guess the easy solution would be open up the U.S. Treasury and start printing more money to pay these bills. That's what, you know, most people might say, we have the power to do that. <laughs> so it's not that easy, though. Yeah. Uh, it's illegal for the government of the United States to print money and be able to pay its debts. That's one. Uh, number two, I think, uh, as most people would understand, mm, the wealth of a nation is really not how many dollars you have in circulation, how many billionaires you've got uh, with a lot of wealth. The wealth of a nation is really its productive capacity. And in our system, it's a very good system, we have tied our money creating ability, at least to some extent, to the productive capacity of the country. And unless we broaden that, unless we raise that, I think printing more bills, more currency, is simply a very disastrous uh, option for us. You know, the federal government has consistently, for decades, run in a budget deficit. How do they pay their bills? Uh, you know, we talk about, you know, paying our, our creditors. H how does a government pay for this problem? The government does essentially two things. Let, let me first illustrate this problem because it's a, it's a very important issue for the public to understand. If you, if the government of the United States were a business venture, a business enterprise, all business enterprises have what we call a balance sheet. The balance sheet of the United States would look like this. On the asset side, you have about $2.7 trillion in assets, worth of assets. That's what the United States government has. On the liability side, we've got about $17 trillion in long-term debt, okay, the national debt, plus about $5 trillion in addition to that in intergovernmental debt that is between government, the government of the United States, between mm -hmm. departments and so on and so forth. So you've got a balance sheet that is awfully out of uh, balance, as it were. Mm -hmm. And so the United States government, to be able to pay its debt, what it, what it does is it, it goes and borrows from many other entities. 53% of the debt the United States holds is from Internally, it's from the public, the Federal Reserve itself. It borrows from the Federal Reserve as well. And uh, from uh, retirement agencies, retirement institutions, and so forth. That's 53% of the total debt. 
The other 47% is owed to foreigners, uh, the Chinese, the Japanese, the Germans, and uh, private individuals, and so on and so forth. So the way we have been able to pay for the deficit each year mm -hmm. is by going into the uh, private market, into the market itself, as it were, and borrowing these money so that we can pay uh, the debt, uh, not, not the debt, but the uh, budget requirements for that particular year. But every time you borrow, you continue to push the debt itself, the national debt itself. Each year deficit is added to the national debt, and that is how we've been able to ac uh, accumulate so much debt. debt. W when you say debt, is it, what <coughs> is the debt? Is the debt Social Security? Is the debt um, military. What, what is the debt? What makes up the debt? What makes up the debt is the obligations that the United States government enters into. Some of this in terms of discretionary spending that the government says they will make. Some of these are mandatory spending that the government has in place over many years. Social Security is one of them, retirement payments to the military is another, uh, unemployment compensations, all kinds of obligations that the government had entered into. That is what eventually forms the debt of mm -hmm. the United States. Now, it's no surprise that investors get really nervous when there is discussion on raising the U.S. debt limit. And at the center of it all is the, the market for U.S. treasuries. And treasuries play a crucial role in the global economy. What are U.S. treasuries and why do investors care about them? Okay, there are a number of reasons. First, what are uh, U.S. treasuries? These are the vehicles, the instruments the government of the United States uses to borrow money. What happens in effect, in a theoretical way, is the government prints these beautiful le looking documents and they bring them out to you and they say, if you hold these documents uh, for another, let's say 30 years or 20 years, we will, uh, and give us some money, we will return back to you. It's an IOU. It's an IOU, and uh, uh, we give you this beautiful piece of paper. You give us your money, and we use that money to pay our debt. It's, it's a way of borrowing from the public. So treasury notes are essentially that. It's a promissory note that is given to you, to the public, to the Fed, to foreign governments, and so on and so forth, so that we can have the cash we need right now to be able to pay uh, the obligations that we have entered into. Now, why would anyone be willing to lend to the United States government? Well, if you are the Chinese, you're not going to put your money in uh, Azerbaijan or in Zimbabwe. You wish to put it in the United States of America. It has been and continues to be the most uh, faithful of all debtors. It has been able to pay its debt, and as long as the United States is made up of uh, the territory between Maine and California, it will continue to pay its debt. It's got that obligation to pay. And so most people would rather lend to the United States government. Most government would rather lend to the United States government than anyone else. Our economy is the biggest economy. We have never defaulted before, and that's why this default is very scary to a lot of them and gives them a lot of concern. And we have, as I said earlier, we have the capacity to broaden our economy uh, because we can produce more. And if we do that, uh, the faith that other countries and other nations uh, have in us is strengthened even more. And that's why people wish to buy these treasury uh, uh, notes from the United States government. It's a vehicle to borrow money from the government. And I'm assuming the, the interest on these treasuries um, pretty it's high. It's pretty good. Pretty, it, I would it, say it's, it's pretty, pretty good. good. That's why these uh, countries want to invest in uh, the U.S. Precisely. It's, it, it, uh, even beyond the, treasure, uh, the interest rate, uh, but the security that uh, the United States government will pay me back is really the most important uh, factor in this case, in addition to the uh, nice uh, interest rates that one is uh, going to be able to earn. Well, what's been going on with the U.S. Treasury since this uh, 
debt ceiling debate has really kind of turned nasty. Uh, it, it, uh, that you would expect of any market when there is uncertainty. It, it mm -hmm. happens to stocks, it happens to treasury bills, and so on and so forth. When there is uncertainty, people are not sure what to do. And one of the dangers of uh, a default, in fact, even the stages of default, is that there are going to be extreme price movements in just about everything. And that is dangerous, and that's why you see some of these uh, movements in price, including treasury as well as stocks uh, at the present time. It creates quite a bit of uncertainty in terms of what is likely to happen uh, down the road. And there could be uncertainty between bank to bank lending as well if there, if there is if there is um, no solution to this which as you said and we'll get to that eventually there's going to be a plan put in place but if if there is no plan reached this week bank to bank lending could be affected it could be uh, it could be affected uh, you know banks borrow from one another for a variety of reasons uh, mm -hmm. some of them hold assets uh, in that way some of them borrow from the federal reserve but every time they borrow, they have to pay interest rates as well. Uh, these interest rates uh, get affected as a result of this uncertainty. That's what happens. The price for money is interest rates. And if, if the price of everything fluctuates in an extreme way, interest rates are going to be affected. Bank lending to one another is going to be affected. All loans that banks make in turn get affected, including um, student loans uh, that uh, most of uh, the students borrow to to invest in their future. So what we need to do is avoid mm, getting into a situation where there are extreme price movements of any, th of any sort, of any kind. If the U.S. does fall into default, how does it affect me? Uh, me I as in the general I mean, public, because that's, you know, that's what people want to know. They, they hear it, they hear it every day, they hear yeah. it multiple times a day, yeah. and unless it means they're not getting some sort of paycheck in their mailbox, yes. mm -hmm. they're going on with their day. Uh, if the U.S. defaults, that's precisely what is going to happen. But let me preface my remark mm -hmm. in that regard. I don't think the United States government is going to default. I think, uh, before I come to the, respond to that question, mm -hmm. what happens to me, I think politicians uh, being who they are, I don't want to be cynical about this, I think they're trying to capture the nation's attention to the kind of work that they do. I, I, I hope that is what uh, at least uh, they, uh, they think they're doing. Uh, because defaulting uh, is a very, has a very serious consequence. Now, what are the consequences? Well, retired military are not going to be able to be paid unless there is a special arrangement just to pay that particular bill. Uh, there's going to be social security that is not going to be paid unless the government said we are going to pay only that piece and forget everything else. So default uh, eventually means that you, if you are going to get any transfer payments, are likely not to get that, mm -hmm. number one. Number two, uh, as I said, the price movements are going to be quite extreme, which includes interest rates. You're going to end up paying very high rates of interest uh, for the kinds of borrowing that you do, and most business people are going to be affected because they have a cr line of credit that is going to be affected by uh, extreme uh, interest rate movements. And you're going to have um, uncertainty not only in the United States, but in the world. It's going to send a, a shock wave uh, that might cause a financial collapse worse than the one we just had uh, a few years ago. And I think that is a very, very serious consequence for everybody. You can't have mortgages, you can't borrow for a car, you can't pay your own bills because you may be expecting a check from the federal government, which is not likely to arrive. All of these are going to affect you personally. If a plan is reached, and the way that I understand it, if a, if a plan is reached this week, it will carry through till January the 15th. Two-part question. How does the government decide which bills to pay? Mm. Number one. Number two, what happens January 16th? Mm. Uh, the last question first. Uh, what happens uh, January 16th? If that is indeed the agreement they make, well, we go through the process all over again. 
we start all over again because what we have done in the past is at least extend the debt ceiling uh, by a year or two. That's what we have done. But if they're going to just do for a few months, we go through the same process all over again. Hopefully then, perhaps by then, some of these issues, the attendant issues, the issues that have been used as a, a way of introducing um, the debt li limit, uh, raising the debt limit, will perhaps have been solved by then and we have a semi-permanent raising uh, of the debt uh, ceiling it, itself at that time. But uh, how does the government pay its bills then and how do they choose? Well, it depends on what the political desire of a particular uh, party or individual is going to be. Theoretically, it's the President of the United States that pays all these bills through the government agencies. So they may decide to say, well, uh, we have a military and uh, we need a military and so we could only pay bills that are related to that. They may just go ahead and do that. So what uh, criteria uh, they might use, who knows? It's a political process. Everything would be tied in a process in that case. In getting back to a solution, mm -hmm. it would seem to me that every year that ceiling is going to get higher and higher and higher and always be there. If more money is not going to be printed, which obviously that's not a solution, what is the solution to this crisis? I think, uh, in general, we agree. Uh, I think politicians agree and economists agree that we have too much debt. And uh, when we say we have too much debt in relation to what? Well, in relation to the kinds of things we're spending that money on in relation to that. I think having a lower debt has uh, uh, quite a few advantages. Lower debt implies uh, there is room for economic growth. It will help economic growth. Um, it also provides opportunities for individuals uh, to uh, be creative in the way they, uh, if, if, if they're business people, for example, to expand their businesses and so on and so forth. Um, it also gives the policymakers opportunity and leeway uh, to implement uh, certain kinds of programs. So a lower debt limit has absolute advantages for the United States. In addition to that, the payment to service these, uh, the, the debt itself, the interest rate, would go down. It would be smaller. Right now we pay about half a trillion dollars each year in interest payments. Now, if we reduce uh, the, the, the debt itself is lower than 16, 17 percent, that is like, uh, I mean, a trillion that's likely to be, the interest rates, uh, the interest payments would be lower. That means lower taxes, hopefully, so, because we don't have to service a huge debt. So there are advantages to that. So that's, the solution would be, uh, number one, not try to solve all of these problems in one day, in one year. Drastic cuts are very dangerous in the United States economy. That's one of the things that we need to avoid. Gradual, sustained cuts in the kinds of things that needed to be cut is a very important solution, and I think that's one of the uh, opportunities, perhaps, that uh, the government has. The other is we need to grow the economy. Right now is not the time to reduce the growth of the economy. Uh, we're just coming out of a recession. The economy is recovering. It's recovering in a very healthy way compared to where we have been. And it's not a very good time to introduce these kinds of issues and to cut government spending or all spending in general. Gradual but sustained cut of government expenditure is really what we need to do. Of course, that depends on who is willing to give up on the programs that are likely to be cut. We have one minute, and you seem very confident that a, a deal will be reached. Why is that? I am confident, as confident as a non-politician can be. <laughs> the reason I say that is because uh, either of the two parties do not wish for the United States to go into a default situation, number one. Number two, it's the most uh, unlikely result uh, given that um, both parties know that the consequences are very severe.
very interesting conversation today. It'll be interesting to see what happens in Washington this week and the weeks to come. Thank you so much for the conversation today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. You are very welcome. And if there's a topic you'd like discussed here on At Issue, contact us at weiu at weiu.net. For At Issue, I'm your host, Kelly Runyon. Thanks for joining us.